Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads Church. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Fantastic. You guys look beautiful. Happy holidays. How many of you guys are off tomorrow? Yes. Seven of you. Good. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here. And this morning we begin a series entitled Walking with a Limp. Can you say that with me? Walking with a Limp. Walking, Walking with a Limp. Before we get into this morning's message, let me just give a shout out to, first of all, my wife who's watching online. Say, babe, love you. And Miss Natalie is just an amazing. Actually, let's give her a hand real quick. Yes. I will probably get something good later. <laughs> uh, second thing, you'll notice all of our groups, this is the second week of what we call Rally Week. Um, our small groups are, are come quarterly now. We haven't been doing groups since pre-COVID, you know, pre so now we're just launching them uh, this fall. And so you'll see a bunch of small groups throughout um, the, uh, the, the living room here. Now, if I was going to get into a small group, seriously, if I was younger in the Lord and um, I, I was not sure of how, you know, when the curveballs of life take place, when stuff happens in my life, I wasn't real sure how to navigate through those things, how to hear God's voice, how to understand God's word. And so there's a group over there. It's called SD. They're called Sustainable Discipleship. They're discipleship groups. And basically, we're just going to go through the year reading scripture. And we're going to highlight those things that, he's, that are just being brought out by the Holy Spirit. We're going to teach you how to uh, listen to God's voice and how to implement truth in scripture and in to your, into your life, and you'll become a good, solid, grounded believer in Jesus. So there's only a handful of them out there. They, I think there's like seven opportunities to get involved in that. Uh, so I really encourage you to at least take a look at that, all right? Is that good? Yes, sir. All right, good morning. So walk in with a limp. So the idea of this whole series, the big idea is that we're basically going to be dealing with our frailties, with our humanities. Facing the humanity side of our lives, yet having faith that God is still bigger than all of our failures. Amen. Amen. There's, there's, there's a contradiction a lot of times that goes on in our lives. And you guys ever notice that? Yes, sir. You're doing well, then you're doing stupid. <laughs> you know your identity in Christ Jesus, you got victory, but here you're messing with this stuff again. Yeah. Over and over and over and over again. Our past failures may oppose us, but they won't overpower us. Right. Amen. Walk in with the limp. You may be limping, but you're not limited. You may be broken, or you may be bent, but you're not broken. The idea that you may be twisted up, but we're not giving up. Amen. The Amen. idea that you may have fallen again and again, but you will rise again Ooh, in God's strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me remind you of a passage of scripture in Psalms where it says, the righteous man may fall seven, you can add a T-Y on there, 70 times, and he will rise again. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Even though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. Why? Because the Lord will uphold him with his righteous right hand. That's who our God is. Over and over, the enemy wants to shame you. The enemy wants to break you. The enemy wants to just bring you down to a place in the pit and destroy you. But we're reminded in Micah, the seventh chapter, about this. It says, don't rejoice over me, my enemy. You might try to condemn me. You might just try to keep me down. You might try to just get me to raise the, the, the white surrender, you know, the flag of surrender. But when I fall, I will rise. And if I'm sitting in darkness, God will be a light unto my path. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. But the same... Um, idea that that is so true. The other thing equally important is that we can't serve God into our future if we continue living in our past. Right. We've got to come to terms with stuff in our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody nervous yet? <laughs> I'm not going to meddle. We're just going to talk about some good stuff here this morning. Right. It's the idea of Jacob, the story of Jacob in scripture. You know, a few weeks ago, um, a little bit after my mom passed, um, we were in the backyard, Natalie and I were in the backyard of my house, and we were just hanging out there, just talking about different things, and, and the phone rang. And once the phone rang, I turned to go see who it was. It was Natalie's phone, and I tripped. I didn't fall, but I tripped, and I heard it go, pow. I'm like, oh, man, my ankle. I twisted my ankle, sprained my ankle. I thought it was a big, bad sprain. And so I dealt with it. You know, it was a telemarketer. I don't know who it was, that stupid guy, person. And next day, it still hurt. 
the following week, it was still hurting a little bit. It's like, man, I got to, something's going on here. Something ain't right. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make a, I hardly ever make appointments with doctors, but I went ahead and made an appointment. I said, he goes, what's going on? It's like, man, I don't know. I just, I twisted something or something. Does it hurt here? No, does it hurt here? Ah, yes, it hurts right there. He goes, hmm. It's like, what is that? Hmm. I'll call you back in a little bit. Got some x-rays. And he calls me back that afternoon. He goes, Mr. Avalos? He goes, you have a fractured ankle. You're going to be out for about six months. It's like, what do you mean I'm going to be out? I can't be out six months. He goes, just go to this person, and he's going to tell you what to do. So I went to this man's place, another doctor, another hundred bucks, whatever. <laughs> and uh, he says, hey, you're going to have to wear this. He's putting me on this brace. He's showing me some stuff. So I said, wait a minute. I said, be truthful. I said, do I really need that? I mean, like, am I okay if I don't wear that? He goes, yeah, you don't, you don't need it. He goes, I'm just going to try to help you and brace yourself and get your healing faster. I said, sweet. I said, I don't need that. And he goes, no, I, you don't need that. You don't need that. I was like, okay, but it's going to take you about six months. It's like, I'm good with six months. He goes, but if you twist it again, you're probably just going to break it. Like, that's okay. I'd rather just deal with it. I'll be careful. <laughs> so I got out of the doctor, and I was like, where's your brace? He's like, eh, I don't need that brace. So I walked out with a limp. I've been limping for a little while. It's getting better, but it's only been three months or so. Yesterday we were at men's breakfast, Band of Brothers, and I noticed Roger, the saxophone player. Isn't he awesome? I mean, I'm telling you, this guy was like absolutely, the whole band. I'm like, are you kidding me? Let's just keep worshiping. Forget the message. You know, let's just keep going. I mean, Brandy, uh, by the way, this is Brandy's family up here. I just met them. I'm so glad you guys came. Um, keep coming back. Roger, I noticed Roger's walking with a limp. It's like, what's the matter, Roger? He goes, oh, I just spilled some coffee. He goes, and I was on my fl- on, on all four, cleaning it up. And as I was going forward, you know, I was cleaning up the stuff, and I tried to go backwards, but my toe didn't go back with me. And he bent it, because when I heard it snap, I'm like, ah, oh, because I think I got a broken toe. So Roger's walking with a limp. <laughs> and I was reminded of our worship pastor, Jeremiah Roby. I don't know if you ever noticed, but look at him walk. He walks with a, he walks with a limp. Why? I don't know how he did it. He told his story, but I forgot about it. All I know is that he got his gun and he shot himself in the foot. <laughs> Something like that. I was like, I've never heard of anybody doing that. Slices. But it, is it through that that you met your wife? Kind of that? So she, she figured out how much she likes taking care of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, their relationship was stronger because of that situation that took place. So here's what I know about every single one of us here this morning. We may have not ever experienced a fractured ankle like I have, but man, we have all experienced a fractured soul. A fractured and wounded soul, right? We may not have experienced a fracture or a broken toe like Roger did, but how many of us have experienced a broken heart yes, sir. and a broken conscience yes, sir. and a broken, you know, we used to be convicted about certain things, but, but we, we just kind of kept siding into that area and that, and that thing's broken in our lives now. We might have not have ever shot ourselves with a gun in our foot, but how many of us have shot ourselves with shame and guilt and condemnation? And self-blame always because of the stuff that we are constantly contending with. And we're just killing ourselves and shooting ourselves, damaging our heart, getting us weaker and weaker and weaker. We're walking with a limp, many of us spiritually, many of us even emotionally. But here's the good news. We're still here. Not only are we still here, but God is still here. He's a very present help in time of trouble. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He's Jaira. He's more than enough. He's always enough. Regardless of what we're facing, how low we're feeling, how bad we've done, he's still tugging at us, and he's still wanting to bless us, and he's still wanting us to chase us with his goodness. That's who our God is. And so here's, here's, here's true humility as a disciple of Jesus. Here's what you and I have to come to terms with. Here's this big idea. Lord, help me. In one hand, I have the victory in Christ Jesus. But on the other hand, I realize that I'm just wrecked and human and frail and fractured and just blowing it constantly. I've been redeemed by God's blood and I have the victory in the Lord. 
There's a lion inside of me. Now I'm bold and confident and courageous. Sometimes I feel like a little pussycat. Wet with the hose from my neighbor. <laughs> Damaged. Man, that's a good picture, isn't it? We all have stuff to contend with. We all have stuff that we have to deal with. Isn't that the truth? I mean, even little Johnny knows that. Like, who's little Johnny? Little Johnny's a guy I talk about almost every week whenever I'm in the pulpit. The teacher comes up to little Johnny and goes, hey, little Johnny, he goes, as you get older, every adult, almost every adult will have a, 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 an adult deep secret inside, stuff that only they know they are contending with. And they can easily be manipulated, little Johnny. So little Johnny's like, hmm, I'm going to test this. So Johnny comes home from school. Mom opens up the door. He goes, hey, Mom. Mom, I know everything. And she's like, Johnny, shh. She shushes him. Don't you say nothing, little Johnny. Here's $10. Don't you tell your dad. And Johnny's like, wow, this guy's awesome. So I think I'm going to keep trying this. An hour later, dad comes home from work. Hey, dad. Hey, buddy. Hey, dad. I know everything. He goes, little Johnny, go to your room. Here's $100. Don't you say nothing. <laughs> Mind your own business. Little Johnny's like, yeah, that's awesome. Just then there's a knock at the door, and he opens up the door, and the mailman's there. He goes, hey, Mr. Mailman. Hey, I know everything. And he drops all of his mail, and he gets on his floor, and he's tearing up. He goes, oh, little Johnny. He goes, man, come say hello to your daddy. <laughs> it's horrible, right? Give your daddy a hug for me. And that's, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, this, this idea, this, this tension that who we are, who we really are, and who God says that we were meant to be. Walking with the Limp is the story of Jacob, and we're going to be looking at Jacob's life throughout this whole month, and I really, really encourage you. Um, and what stood out to me, there's a lot of things that stood out to me. But what stood out to me more than anything is that there's stuff that we have to just face constantly in our walk with Christ. So today we're looking at the limp, Jacob's limp. Next week we'll look at Jacob's lentils. He had to make some lentil soup. I call it mole. <laughs> the following week we're going to look at Jacob's ladder because that's a real big story in there. And then at the very end we're going to be looking at Jacob's future, his legacy. But this morning we'll take a look at walking or Jacob's limp. Is that okay this morning? So let me give you a big idea, a big snapshot, big picture. It's just the introduction today, but I have to give you a big picture of who this character is, Jacob, that we find in scripture. Really encourage you to just read Genesis, and you'll see the story of Jacob there from 22 all the way to 30-something. I think I read like 30 chapters a couple of days ago, just trying to wrap my brain around some, some highlights, some things that I want to share with you this uh, next month. And so, first of all, Jacob is a liar. Amen. No, it's not good. <laughs> he's a liar. He's a con man. He's a trickster. He's a fraud. He, met, he spent much of his life being haunted by the bad decisions that he made, self-inflicted consequences over and over again. If anyone deserved to be called unqualified, it was this guy right here, this guy named Jacob. But yet he's one of the great patriarchs. He's one of the three major patriarchs in our walk, in our faith with, with the Lord. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's, he's the God of Jacob. But this guy was all messed up. So big view, big macro view, think big with me, think 30-foot perspective with me, and let's take a look at maybe three of the stories, highlight three of the stories that we find Jacob actually manipulating, scheming. You'll find this quality in him. He's always going back, and he's always trying to scheme and connive and, and trying to get ahead of the game with his own flesh, with his own thinking, with his own patterns that he's constantly contending with. Is that Okay. We'll see that when he's trying to take his brother's birthright. We'll see when he's trying to take his brother's, not only birthright, but his blessing also. And then he has to leave because his, his brother's really upset. And on his way back, we'll see it again when he's coming back to a place uh, near Bethel, which means the house of God. So we'll look at this right here. And in your notes, on your app, we'll start here in this passage. But first of all, you remember Jacob has a grandfather 
And his grandfather's name, does anybody know? It's Abraham. Abraham is his grandfather. Remember, Abraham has a son, his only son, at 90-something years old, 100 years old, and he names his son Isaac. And Isaac was the one that God told Abraham, I need you to go sacrifice your own son. As a matter of fact, that song, Jireh, is connected. That's when they called on, this, on his name, Jehovah Jireh, who is the Lord who provides. It was in that moment, in that story, when he was going to be sacrificed. And between the knife going up and going down into a son, there was an angel that interrupted and said, hey, here's a ram in the thicket. God has provided for you. He's always enough. He's always more than enough. Amen. Isaac gets married to Rebecca, and they get pregnant, or she gets pregnant, and they have, there's a struggle going on while she is pregnant. It's like, what's going on here? Well, there's a, a, a wrestling match happening. She has twins. One of them's name is Esau, and the other one's name is Jacob. And Esau is the older. He comes out of the womb first. He's a red, hairy guy that is jumping out of the womb first. But right behind Esau is Jacob, right on his heels. As a matter of fact, he's grabbing his brother's heels, trying to pull him back down maybe so that he can become the first guy. But he's not the first guy. He's the second guy. The firstborn always gets the birthright and always gets the blessing. There's something special about that firstborn. But Jacob is trying to make sure. He's in the very beginning. We see him trying to connive and trying to get ahead of the game. And we see that throughout his whole history, deceitfully manipulating, pacifying, conniving, scheming, on and on. In the beginning, when, well, a little bit when they get, they get older, see, Esau was in, the oldest and he loved hunting. And you guys love, love hunting? Two of you, great. So he was out hunting. He, he loved going outdoors. And as a matter of fact, he was favored by uh, his dad. He goes out hunting and he was... On his way back in, he was really, really tired. He was like, man, exhausted. I don't know if he killed a bunch of game or whatever, but Jacob was a mama's boy. His mom was favor uh, mom favored Jacob more than he did Esau. Jacob would stay at home. He would learn how to cook, and Jacob was cooking some stew. And Esau comes in, and, and he says, man, I am so hungry. I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm so famished. I need some food. And Jacob's already started conniving. He already started scheming. He goes, I'll give you, he goes, let me have some of your soup. I'll give you some of my soup, but not for free. I'll do a little trade for you. I'll tell you what, you give me your birthright for a bowl of soup. He goes, what good is this birthright going to do? He saw thinking or not thinking. He says, just give me some food. So he exchanges his birthright for a bowl of soup. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. But he connived, he schemed, he's he got his way. He got ahead. He goes, man, you might be the firstborn, but I just got your birthright. He sacrificed um, the immediate gratification of his appetite, but he forfeited something in the future. And so that's the first time. The second time is not only did he want his birthright, he also wanted his blessing. And so um, when it came time for his dad to die, it says that his dad was getting old, and uh, he couldn't see anymore, very, very good. So he calls his oldest, Esau, to come. He goes, hey, son, he goes, I need you to go out and get some game. And you know how I like this stew that you make. He goes, go out there and get some game, and I want you to come back because I'm not going to be living too much longer, but I wanted to make sure that I want to bless you before I go home to my forefathers. So Esau takes off to go hunt, to go uh, get some game so he can bring that back and get the blessing from his dad. In the meantime, Mama hears what he was telling the oldest. And Mama says to Jacob, goes, hey, Jacob, I just heard that your dad wants to bless uh, your, your oldest son. He goes, but you deserve the blessing. So I got this scheme. I got this strategy. I got this plan. I wonder where Jacob got his scheme and conniving from. Hmm. Just say it. I love my moms, but be careful not to favor them so much that you bend them and you break them and you wound them and you favor them so much that they are manipulating you. <laughs> I love my mom. She went home, but dad was a hard ruled. I was grounded since I was four years old. <laughs> but I loved being grounded when mom was home. 
and dad had swing shift from 3 o'clock to 11 or 4 to 12. I get out of school at 3. Dad was gone, but I was grounded. Mom was at home. He goes, Mia, go ahead. Go play. <laughs> yes, thank you. Anybody have moms like that? <laughs> so she has this plan and tells Jacob, goes, hey, uh, here's what I want you to do. Go get this game. Bring it here. I'm going to make some awesome soup stew that your, your dad loves. I know how to make it. I know how to appease his appetite. And then I want you to go uh, act as if though you were Esau so that you could get this blessing. And Jacob's like, man, I can't do that. He's going to know that I'm not Esau. He's going to know that I'm Jacob. And if he knows that, I'm going to be cursed. He's going to curse me. And she says, he goes, if he curses you, he finds out, let that curse rest upon me. So she begins to connive, and she gets the food. She begins to make the stew. She dresses Jacob with Esau's clothes and then takes some skin from an animal and puts it all over him because, you know, Jacob was a clean-cut, smooth, no-hair guy. And Esau was a hairy mess, okay? Anybody married to a redhead? Good. In first service, there's this lady that's like, ah! She wasn't married to him, but she was dating him. So she was excited. <laughs> kind of freaked me out. It's like, whoa, hold on, woman. Anyways, um, where was I at? So he puts all this stuff on Jacob. Jacob goes to his dad. He goes, Dad, here's your stew. Who are you? He says, I'm Esau. He says, You're Esau. He goes, you have the voice of Jacob. Come over here. Come closer. You can read it, Genesis. And he looks, and he gets closer, he smells him, and he smells like Esau because he has his clothes on. And he touches him, he feels him. Dad's not crazy, he's just blind. He says, oh, you are, you are Esau. So he eats the soup, and he proceeds to bless him. And the blessing of the firstborn came upon the schemer, the manipulator, the grabber, the deceiver, Jacob. By the way, Jacob's name means grabbing at the heels He's always trying to get ahead of the game. Another translation says that his name means deceiver. And those are the characteristics that you see throughout all of Jacob's life. Well, Esau comes back in. The blessing's already upon Jacob. Esau don't know anything. He says, hey, Dad, here's the stew. He goes, who is that? He goes, I'm Esau. I'm doing what you told me to do. He goes, well, who did I just bless? And Esau immediately, it's like, it's Jacob. He not only stole my birthright, now he stole my blessing. Dad, is there any blessing left for me? Just bless me, please. I've already given my blessing away. I can't bless you. And Esau got so angry, got so upset, he got so uptight, he was furious and raging inside that he said, man, dad's about to die. And when dad dies, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Mom got word that Esau was that upset. So she pulls Jacob aside. He goes, son, he goes, uh, she said, I think your brother's a little upset. <laughs> he wants to kill you, wants to hurt you. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to my brother's house, your uncle Laban. Get away for a while. And I'll bring back word when it's time for you to come back home when Esau's anger and rage has calmed down a little bit. So he takes off and he leaves. He didn't come back for 21 years. And I don't know if Esau was mad 21 years, but he was just gone 21 years. On his way to Laban's place, God has an experience with this man called Jacob. He lays his head on a rock. Jacob has a dream, and it's a dream of angels going up and down. It's like a ladder, going up and down a ladder. We talk about it in week three. It's a powerful, powerful message. And he says, wow, Surely the Lord is in this place. And God made a promise to Jacob. And he moves forward, goes to Laban, and it was there that the deceiver in the middle of Laban's home that he got deceived himself. Because when he goes over there, he sees that Laban has a daughter, uh, a couple of daughters, but one of them was named Rachel. And man, she was fine looking. He goes, I want this girl right here. Can I marry her? He goes, yeah, just work for me for seven years. So he works for seven years. The next thing you know, they consummate the marriage. It was nighttime, so they put him in there. I don't know how all that works, but like, really? He goes, I would have known that it's not, you know, Rachel. 
But they consummate the marriage. When he wakes up the next morning, he realizes that it's not Rachel, the one he loved, the one he worked for for seven years. It's, it's the sister, Le- uh, uh, Leah. Like, oh, man, he goes, hey, you deceived me. Hey, you tricked me. Hey, you're messing with my head here. What's going on? He goes, ah, all of a sudden, you reap what you sow. You don't like that. He goes, well, I goes, I, I, it's, it's our tradition here that you can't give the younger one. You've got to give the older one first. Work for me another seven years, and then I'll give you Rachel. And he works another seven years. Long story short, he works another seven years after that to get all the flocks, all the blessing, all the stuff. There's a lot of, uh, involved in that story. But here we are 21 years later. And now it's time to go back home, to go back home to a brother who's upset because this brother not only stole his birthright, but he stole his blessing. Now he's on his way back home. And Jacob wanted to make sure, like, hey, I have to make sure. He starts scheming again. He starts manipulating again. He starts saying, that, hey, listen, I, I, don't, I, I don't, you know, God's promised me that my family um, will, will be blessed. But this guy's upset. Let me try to pacify him. Let me try to come up with a scheme and a plan so that by the time uh, he gets to me, There's a lot of blessings. There's a lot of gifts that he's going to be receiving on my behalf. So he sends messengers over there with a bunch of stuff. And he goes, hey, tell your brother I want to find favor with him. Tell him I'm coming to visit him. I'm going to come back home. So the messengers go and they tell Esau. And the scripture says that Esau didn't say anything. But all I know is that he came back and the messengers told Jacob, hey, I told him what you told me. I gave him what you gave me. But he didn't say anything. All he said, he goes, I'm going to go see Jacob. And he's bringing 400 men with him. It's like, oh, shoot, I'm done. I don't know if he thought that, but I would have thought that. Did he receive my gifts? Or was he coming with 400 men to kill me like he said he was? So he's in fear. He's broken. He's in that place right now where he's wondering what's going on. So on his way back home, he didn't stop. On his way, he continues to sting. He goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to split my family and all my goods and all the blessings that God has given him. Because God still blessed him. God still chose him. God still was honoring him. He goes, how does he do that? How, does God, how could God bless a guy like Jacob? Great question. You know what a better question is? How can God still continue to bless us? We are Jacob. You and I are Jacob. We have those tendencies. We have stuff that we have to contend with. But here's the reason why God never um, cursed him. He still continued to bless him. Because there's one thing that you can say good about Jacob is this, that he never turned to false gods. He never chased after false gods. As a matter of fact, he told his households, you put away those arubs, you put away those false things, we will worship the Lord God Almighty only, and him we will only worship. In the meantime, let me try to get your stuff. Anybody knows, notice, I mean, everybody's, you know, I contend with that stuff. Try to get ahead. Sometimes I do it with my own strength, my own power, my own wits. Some of you guys who know me, you know my mind's crazy. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> and so here he comes back, and he decides to uh, divide his household. When Esau's coming on his way, he decides to divide his household into threes. He puts um, a bunch of them in the front. He goes, hey, if Esau comes and he's still mad at me, he's going to wipe them out. At least the second group, they have an opportunity to escape. And he wasn't part of the first. He wasn't part of the second. He was the last. He's scheming. He goes, man, I've got to survive here. On his way, he's also crying out to God. He's afraid, but he's praying. He's asking God, man, you promised me. You promised that you would bless me. You promised me I need your blessing. I, 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 I want your favor. Help me. He, was so, he wanted God to keep his word, even though he wasn't keeping his own word to, to others. And this is where we find ourselves right here in uh, Genesis. Where am I at? In verse 22 and 31 of chapter 32. That night, Jacob got up and took two wives. Man, as if one wasn't enough. Two female servants, 11 sons, crossed over the fort of Jabbok. What do you do when you're coming to terms with all your stuff? You're coming face to face. It's like, oh, man, all this stuff's going to come to haunt me now. 
Well, he takes his family, he takes those things that he loves, he takes all of his possession, and he sends them across the stream. He sends them to the other side, to this path, and he comes back over across, and he is there alone. When you find yourself, when God's just wanting to make some things and get some things right in your life, uh, it's a good thing, when you want to get things right, it's a good thing to just get away, leave all your possessions, leave all the stuff that you think mean a whole lot to you, and just get alone with God and do some wrestling. Do some wrestling. Do some evaluating. Why is Jacob afraid? Because all of his life he's been deceiving. All of his life he's been struggling. All of his life he's been fighting. All of his life he's been conniving. And there comes a time when you and I must face our weaknesses, face our struggles, face our failures. Why? Because he loves us too much to leave us that way. We all contend with stuff, but he loves us too much. And there comes a time when you, 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 you have to come face to face, and, and, it, and it's a progress. It never stops. Oh, man, I dealt with that. I thank God I'm free. Oh, but this thing came up now. This thing came up now. And he's, it's called the sancti- theology sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit. So when you're tired of being where you're at in life, go to a place alone with God and begin wrestling with that thing. In the middle of the night, the scripture says that a man began to wrestle with him till daybreak. It was not only an angel, it was God himself. He comes in the middle of the night and he's contending with him and he's wrestling. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of... It's not that Jacob was so strong that he was stronger than God because it was just with the touch that he broke Jacob's hip. He dislocated Jacob's hip just with the touch. I'm thinking, let this man wrestle. Let me get him tired because once he's tired, then he'll start listening. So he's wrestling with him all night. And then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. I'm like, who is this guy? He can't be exposed in the daytime. Is he a zombie? Who is he? But Jacob replied, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You don't understand. I've been doing this all my life, and I need your favor. I need God's favor. I need to be forgiven. I need this thing to be wiped away so that when I face Esau, I'm not going to die. I will continue. I love Rachel. I love the stuff that God's given me. I love my heavenly father, but I can't leave you until you bless me. I know I've got a, I know I've got stuff, but I also know that God gave me a promise, a promise for a future, and I'm not letting you go until, until, until I get this. And so he wrestles all night, and I love what this man said. He goes, okay, you're tired, huh? You're tired. You want my favor? He goes, okay. Let me, let me ask you this. What's your name? What's your name? Tell me your name. What have you been doing all this time? Tell me your name. And he stops, and I love that. I love that. Jacob responds, he goes, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm a deceiver. I'm a liar. I'm a manipulator. I'm a schemer. I'm always trying to get ahead in my own ways. That's who I am. I came face to face with God and face to face with his stuff. It was only in that place that the blessing would come. Then right afterwards, notice what happens. Then the man said, thank you for saying you're Jacob. That is who you are. But your name will no longer be deceiver, grabber, fighter. I'm going to give you a new identity now. Your name will now be Israel. What does Israel mean? Let God prevail. Let God do your battles. Because you struggled with God and humans, but now you have overcome. Isn't that powerful? Imagine the power of that moment right there. Jacob, you've been fighting all your life. You've been struggling all your life. Now, listen, thank you for admitting that. Now let me fight your battles instead of you trying to get ahead in your own strength. Let me do this for you, Jacob. 
And all of a sudden, the favor of God was upon him. And then Jacob turns around and he says, tell me your name, sir. But he replied, he goes, why do you ask my name? He says, I'm not going to tell you my name. But here's what you will know. You'll experience my name. And it says he blessed him there. Sometimes God's silent when it comes to who he is. But all of a sudden, we get on the other side. It's like, oh, God has been here all along. He's blessed me. I got to this other side only because of God's grace, only because of God's glory. And Jacob called that place Peniel because it says it was because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Now, here's the point of the story. I finally come to the point, okay? I feel like I'm in the introduction. But here's the point. The blessing came when Jacob owned up to his own identity, both the good and the bad. I mean, I'm tired. I'm tired of always grabbing and always trying to get ahead in my own strength, in my own power. I'm always falling short. But if I take the time and admit some of the things that I'm facing and contending with in my own soul, in my own life, as a follower of Christ, as a pastor of a local church, if I just stop and say, okay, this is who I am, this is what I've been doing, God, it's not like you don't know, I am so sorry. And I'm wrestling with certain stuff. It was then that the blessings of God, that the grace of God, here's what I'm finding out. When I find myself in those places, I'm wrestling and I'm trying to grab something from God. All along, his grace is trying to grab a hold of me. All along, he's trying to get a hold of me and help me to identify more with the new identity rather than this old man. It's not what I get. In life, it's not the stuff that we get the stuff that we contend for, we try to grab. It's, it's who we're trying to become, who he wants us to become that matters. And sometimes we just get off focus and get off course. How is this going to, how am I going to get, how am I going to get to this place? I don't want to be like my parents. I don't want to be like this. I got to get ahead. I got to do better. It's not what you get, friends. It's who you become. Even if you have all that stuff, but you become a fool, it's not good. It's not good for your kids. It's not good for your grandkids. It's not good for your legacy. But he came face to face with his realities. And here's the beautiful thing. That next verse just says so much to me. It says, after he came face to face with that, it says, the sun rose above him as he passed that place where he was wrestling with God. And he was different because he was walking with a limp. Many of us are walking with a limp because we've had a face to face encounter with God. But you know what? That's a good thing. Because with, with one foot, he's dragging. With the other foot's good. With one foot, he's reminded of all of his past failures. With all of his past conniving. With all of his past manipulating. But the other foot, he's in stride with God. With one foot, he's identifying that old man. But with the other foot, this is who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And if you continue to focus on your new identity, you're going to stop acting like the old fool. For me, when I'm dragging and I'm walking with the limp, it's a reminder, not of my stupidness, it's a reminder of how God's grace met me and the God of mercy met me and the God of forgiveness met me. And even though I've been doing that stuff, this is who I am. I stand up straight on this other foot. And I lean and I lean towards this side more than I do this other side. I can complain about the limb, but I'm not here to complain about the limb. I'm here to walk on the good, the good side and focus on this side and stay strong in this area. And what will eventually happen, I hope, is that my nerves and I'll start getting feeling back over here and this thing will start kicking again. Yeah. 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 Amen. So here's the beautiful picture. Here's what I want you to go home and do. I want you to go home, and I want you to ask yourself one question. Here's the question. What is your name? What is your name? What's that thing that you're messing around with? What's that thing? You know that God's got his hand upon you. I'm not talking about ten things. It's like, man, I got ten things. Well, just what's one thing? What's that? What, what's your name? Can you get that quote back over there? It says, with one step, you have to understand who you can pretend to be, but with the other foot, you have to walk by faith and become all that God wants you to be. But you can't get to that place until you answer this. What is your name? Until you expose that shady side of yourself. You know what I love about this story more than anything? 
is that after this whole experience takes place, later on in his life, you'll see Jacob's name. Sometimes they'll call him Jacob. Sometimes they'll call him Israel. Sometimes they'll call him Jacob. Sometimes they'll call him Israel. Why is that? Because we're so complicated. And this idea in this life, this change that takes place in our life, it's so complicated. It takes uh, 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 the rest of our lives to, 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 to contend with this. Over and over again, we're going to have to come to terms. Discovering who you are and what God has meant you to become is a lifelong journey. And it's about knowing that we're both Jacob and Israel at the same time. And the more we understand that we are Israel in God's eyes, the less we'll find ourselves walking like Jacob, the old man. And so wrestle with that this week. I'm sorry I'm leaving you like that, but wrestle with that. We all got stuff that we got to deal with, right? We got a holiday weekend. It's Labor Day. You don't have anything else to do. Wrestle with that while you're cooking your brisket. Wrestle with that when you're hanging out and drinking a beer and watching the Cowboys, or maybe that's next week. Oh, by the way, uh, every Sunday night whenever there's a game, a Cowboys game, we're watching it at the gathering. You're more than welcome to come. We're just hanging out, we're just barbecuing or whatever. You're more than welcome to come. But wrestle with that. And you know the beautiful thing? Two nights ago, I was asleep. I tend to sleep every now and then. All of a sudden, a, a light just came. I mean, literally just a light came on, and I saw it. I saw this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the gospel. This is the gospel right before me. I've been reading and reading and studying. This is the gospel message. What is You know, when you see the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, it's the covenant, it's the redemptive story of the gospel. Because every covenant needs an initiator of a covenant. That's Abraham. He was the father of our faith. The covenant started with him. Every covenant needs a sacrifice. That was Isaac, his son. He became the sacrifice, a willing sacrifice, ready to pay and redeem. But every covenant also not only needs an initiator, not only needs a sacrifice, but it also needs a human to believe, a human to be redeemed. And that's Jacob. That's the human part. Abraham is the father part. Isaac is the son part. And Jacob is our part. We are the humans that need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus because of our Heavenly Father's grace and mercy. Isn't that powerful? Receive that. Receive that. In Jesus' name, let's all stand. Father, we are so thankful for the word of God. Lord, I don't know how this lands in people's hearts. I know how it landed in my heart. And I'm thankful that you passed by and made me aware of some of the things that I tend to forget or tend to ignore. And Master, I'm just asking that you would just come in a special way, especially to our, us as men, because men, Lord, we just, we just have a hard time getting away, getting alone, reflecting, and really just paint. We put our head in the, in the sand a lot of times. But I do pray for all the men here, Father God, that you would just visit us as heads of our home, as kings and priests. Visit us, Master, so that we can at least just say, yeah, that's me. That's my name. And I love that, Father, because I know, because of what you've done to me, that you don't meet me in those places with shame or condemnation. You meet me there with grace and forgiveness. You meet me there in those places with love and compassion. If you are ever in the Sikkim area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.